Mental Health News Radio, produced by MHNRnetwork.com, your source for information about our favorite subject, mental health. This show is brought to you by our incredible sponsors like ZenCharts.com, the intelligent EHR for addiction treatment organizations, and MyGenetics, that's M-Y-G-E-N-E-T-X.com, changing the way people are diagnosed and treated around the world, helping you better understand what makes you well. Don't you want information about yourself that empowers your mental health treatment? Also, who is minding the store, the finances of your behavioral health organization? TriadicLLC.com, that's T-R-I-A-D-I-C-L-L-C.com, is a full-service revenue cycle management and billing company focused on all the ins and outs of mental health billing. Our sponsors help keep this show on the air and advocating for everyone affected by mental health. Guess who that is? Everyone in the world. Take a listen to our show all the way to the end. You don't want to miss Miles the Therapy Dog special goodbye. Hey everyone, this is Kristen Walker with Mental Health News Radio and we're back after our holiday hiatus with Dr. Paul Meyer. Hi Paul. Hi Kristen. Hi Melanie. Hi Paul. <laughs> and Melanie Van. <laughs> hey guys. So good to be back together. Yes. I think the last one we did was just before we took the Christmas break and I was sitting in a parking lot for that one and it was awfully cold outside, but man, it was a good show. Tonight we're going to talk about getting older and, you know, lessons learned and the effects that those lessons have on our mental health. Um, and, you know, we all, we have varying, well, Melanie and I are both in our forties. She in her early and mine in my late forties. And Paul, you've already told everyone you're in your 72. early seventies. So we have a nice age span and you just spent time with grandkids. So you've had the young perspective. I've spent time with my 28 year old son and had his perspective of things. And Melanie, you've got your kids. So. Um, we have all these different perspectives to draw on. So um, I think it's a great topic to start the new year off with. Age is a state of mind. <laughs> yes. Really. There's people that are in their teens that think they'll never live to be 30, and they think 30 is old. You know? And then, uh, you know, I'm 72 and feel like I want to work 20 more years because my dad retired when he was 80 and regretted it. You know, and my mom beat me at Domino's when she was 95. So <laughs> for me, you know, 72, I'm just... I feel like a kid, you know, I got a lot, <laughs> 20 more years that I want to work before I retire. <laughs> I love that. And, you know, the whole, I, the, the conversation around retirement has really changed in the last few years. I hear, um, cause you know, I interview people from, you know, all different ages and I know you, Paul, with your patients, um, do as well. And Melanie, I know you do when you were counseling. So the language around it is, is a lot more around, I'm not going to retire because I'm having fun. Retirement is a little bit of a death sentence. So it's not going to happen. So what do you, you know, and that's very different. Before it was, I'm going to work for all these years and then I'm going to retire and then life is going to be fantastic. And I've noticed people that were from, you know, older generations that did that and they very quickly went downhill. Not everybody, but some very quickly went downhill. And, um, and that seems to have, um, informed younger generations about what retirement means to them. Yeah. I know some great football coaches, for example. I love sports and I know some great football coaches who just went whole hog enthusiastically coaching, you know, like college kids or, or high school kids for years and years. And then at maybe 70 or something like that, 68, 65, they would retire and, and die within a year, mm. or two years. Yeah. Wow. And I know, I know men are like that when they lose their wife. When women lose their husbands, they do pretty well. You know, <laughs> we've mentioned that before. <laughs> men, men do, men do horrible without a woman, but women do just fine with or without us. But when a husband loses a wife after 40 or 50 years of being married, there's a statistic that I don't want to misquote it, but it's something like, you know, over half of those men die within 18 months after losing a, a mate, mm. their mate. Mm. The women usually do fine. My mom and dad were very close. They loved each other a lot. And I walked in on them in their apartment when they were in their 80s and they were sitting on the couch smooching, you know. <laughs> and I, about it. I said, you're too old for that. My mom smiled and said, no, oh, no, we're not. 
<laughs> they, uh, they loved each other. Uh, they loved each other a lot. Would watch TV and hold hands and stuff. But when my dad died, he was 84. You know, so they were both about 84. And of course, she grieved. But a couple months later, she said, "Paul, I feel guilty for telling you this, but this is the happiest time of my life. And I loved your dad mm-hmm. dearly. But now I'm now I've got you know. I mean, it was always me and him doing stuff when we were married. Now, now I'm I'm getting together with neighbor ladies and." You know, we're playing skip bowl and, and all these games and getting together every day and doing things. And I'm having, I'm having a blast. I'm having more fun now that I'm a widow than I ever had even when I was married. And I had a fun time being married. Hmm. That's interesting. That is interesting. <laughs> I mean, I think so many women, um, and I don't want to say back in the day and, and say it like that, but I think so. Uh, and still today, women feel obligated to caretake, whether it be children or husband. And when those are no longer around, then maybe they actually start practicing some self-care of their own. So maybe they learn a little bit more about themselves. Paul, how old was your mom when she married your dad? 27. Okay. Well, that's not too young. So she had had some time to live her life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's um it's interesting. I when we were gonna talk about this, I just pulled up the first article that I saw on the internet, and I found some interesting statistics. And I thought I'd read them and see where the, that conversation takes us. Nineteen percent of women age forty to forty four years have no children, as compared to only ten percent in nineteen eighty. In two thousand and nine. One third of Americans age 45 to 63 were single. There's a 50 percent increase from 1980. This trend so size reversing the form of condition. So basically, I mean, th- things are changing. There's a lot more single um, elders now. And I think a lot of people, a lot of elders are living by themselves or don't have children. So that really just changes the whole dynamic of aging in general. Yeah. Yeah. That would be de- that would be depressing to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't like being by myself. If my wife goes out of town for a week to visit the grandkids, I Yeah. I get really I mean, I sort of enjoy it for a day or two. You know, the peace and quiet, you know, but but after a couple of days I'm really I get really lonely. And uh, oh, I don't that's like being living alone. Yeah. That's so I I look at Michael and I uh, Michael's 16 years older than I am so I've forgotten I've stopped adding um that up but he's I think he's 63 and I'm going to be 48 um and he has some physical problems from playing a lot of sports and uh it's so interesting because he is so independent that he absolutely lives alone just fine he loves it when I'm there Like I just came up to visit for the holidays. He does love it when I'm there and we sit and hold hands and watch movies and laugh and just, oh gosh, we have the best relationship. And, but we're both okay to, okay, see ya. (laughs) (laughs) I don't feel this grand desire to, um, you know, need to share a house with anyone. I really would rather live by myself, but if I had to share a house with someone, it would be him. And really because he's very independent and so am I and we do stuff together when we want. But that I know that that's not like his dad is not that way. His dad needs to have company all the time and stuff. So it's, he's that used to bother me about him. And now I'm like, I think I'm lucky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, definitely. For someone people to be that independent. Of, people have a fear of growing older, even even young people, even people in their 20s. Some of them have a fear of growing older and look at all the advertisements on TV for products and things. And then look at midlife crisis. You know, yeah. uh, women and men are looking for somebody to have an affair with or hook up with in one way or another that's 10 or 20 years younger than them. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with marrying somebody that's younger than you. I'm not criticizing anybody, but, but I'm just saying that men and women nowadays are, are looking for somebody 20 or 30 years younger even so they can feel like they're young again you know it's right. just so scary for them to be accepting the fact that we're growing older and it's hard you know, you know it's hard I, to accept that absolutely and i think it's interesting too when people can't be alone meaning the thought of it the very thought of being alone is so terrifying to them especially when they get older that they will latch on to anyone 
it could be a horrible relationship and yet their fear of being alone makes them, you know, drop standards, drop things that they've carried their whole life just to be with someone, to say that they're with someone. And they're almost like, I've watched people just predatory, even seeming, looking, scanning, scanning their horizon for who they can be with because they either got divorced or someone died or whatever, scanning for that next partner because, and I always think, gosh, that's sad. I mean, at least try being alone for a little bit. Maybe there's some things that you'll learn about yourself that would help you grow and be less afraid of life and and getting older and so on. So be alone for a little bit before you latch on to that next person. But, you know, that's, that's could be a judgment I'm making. So I'm afraid of dying alone. That would be scary. You know, see life ebbing away and be all alone in a hospital room with nobody to come visit or anything. It wouldn't have to be me the moment I died, but but dying alone would be uh, a sad thing. Yeah, I think the term for that is elder orphan. There, uh, I think, I mean, I think there are groups now for elder orphans that don't have, you know, they're in nursing homes and they don't have any family that comes to see them or, you know, all of their relatives have passed and maybe they didn't have children. And that would be, that would not be a desirable place to be, I don't think. That's why I feel like, you know, hospice workers or nurses or they're just such special people to be there in the gap of of being in, in your time of passing and not having anyone to be with you during that time. That would be very scary to me too, Paul, to have no support. I know my own family, when my uh, mom's dad was real old, we were visiting him and my aunt who took care of him. And he got up and he used to always rock in his chair and sing hymns and read the Bible in German and stuff. But anyway, he got up and took my mom and, and my aunt and said, come with me in the other room. And he wouldn't let me come with him. I was about 13, I think. And he said, no, you stay here. He took them in the other room and he laid down on his bed. He said, I'm, I'm going to die now. It's time for me to go be with Jesus. Oh, my gosh. And uh, Yeah. And he laid down on the bed and suddenly looked up at the ceiling and had a big smile on his face and pointed at it. And his hand dropped, and that's how he died. Mm. And one of his sons died the same day in a different state. When my dad was in good health at age 84 and still going up on the roof and nailing shingles and stuff, but he had a genetic problem that he didn't know he had. He had an aorta that was about to rupture. Mm. And, and so it ruptured, and instead of dying instantly, he had he went to the emergency room and, and stayed in the hospital in intensive care. But he knew, and we told him the truth, that, he had maybe two or three days to live hmm. and then his body would die. So he, his cells were just holding out. And so I stayed with him toward the, the end when I knew it would be, you know, the last 12 hours or so. I just decided I was going to stay with him till the very end. And uh, so we talked and uh, joked around even. I told him, you know, I said, Dad, now, you know, when you die, you have to go to a, you can't go straight to heaven. You got to go to a, a special place where you learn how to dance first because you were Baptist. <laughs> they won't let you in heaven if you can't dance. Because you know? <laughs> they dance in heaven. And, and uh, you know, he thought he laughed and stuff. And my sister was with us and we sang a hymn. And, and then the same thing happened to him. Then that happened to my grandpa. All of a sudden, he looked real surprised and had a big smile on his face and looked up at the ceiling. And as if he saw something, we didn't see anything, but he saw something. And his head just dropped into my hands. And, and that's how he passed. Mm. with a smile mm. on his face. And then when my mom died, she was 97, and she was just getting old. And, but she was still in pretty good shape when she was 97. We still played games and stuff. But I could beat her after she turned 96. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but she was still in pretty good shape. And, and I had a dream one night where I looked up and saw my mom and dad dancing in heaven. And, um, <laughs> yeah, and I looked up at them and said, Mom and Dad, can I come up and join you? And my mom looked down and said, no, but you'll be here soon enough. <laughs> you know, it makes me worry. So you'll be here soon enough. And a whole song was in the dream, a whole song, a four-minute long song wow. in the dream, Dancing with Mother. You've heard the song Dancing with Father with, I think, Luther Vandross. But, mm-hmm. and, I, and I woke up from the dream and wrote it down. I just scribbled it down really quick because I, I played several musical instruments and things. And it was, it was Dancing with Mother and I uh, sent it to a professional singer and he performed it at a concert and uh and it got published it didn't sell you know it, anything worth a uh, piddly squat but but uh but i heard a song and i told my mom about the song and she said well maybe i'm going to be home with jesus soon 
I said, well, I don't know. And she said, well, get a tape recorder. So she tape recorded a two-minute sermonette for her to preach at her own funeral. Mm. So we recorded it. And sure enough, a few weeks later, she was doing fine. And then and then her kidneys failed. Wow. And the doctor called me up and said, she's going to die in the next you know, in the next 48 hours or so because mm. her kidneys are just rapidly failing. And so I told mom, I, I said, mom, you know, I hate to tell you this, but the doctor said that you're, you're probably going to die in the next couple of days because your kidneys are failing. And she said, oh, I hope he's right. So I've got these aches and pains and I missed your dad. And I'm looking forward to being with Jesus. And, and she got right on the phone and called her grandkids and said, I'm going to be in, in heaven in a couple of days. And I want to make sure you end up being there when you grow up, you know, when you get older. <laughs> And she called her grandkids one at a time and told them. And, and then when she died, I stayed with her again. If it was going to be all night, it was going to be all night. But I stayed with her and stayed awake. And her breasts got shallower and shallower. And the hospice nurse was with us there. And, uh, and, and with her last breath, she looked up at me with a smile and whispered, I love you, Paul. Aww. She whispered, I, I love you, Paul. And she died. And her head fell into my hands. And so death was for me in my family has been a, a blessed thing, a, a wonderful thing. And I, I I mean, in a way, I look forward to it. I don't want to die yet. I like to live to be 100, you know, but <laughs> but if I <laughs> if I did, you know, then it'd be all right. I found out I had cancer uh, last spring and, and got radiation. And, and, I'd, and I thought, well, if, it, if it's my time to go, it's my time to go. But I got radiation and it's all gone. And, and so I'm thankful. You know, cause I, yeah, I you did so time. well through that. But, yeah, yeah. You, guys, you, even you guys helped me. I share it with you guys and you <laughs> prayed me through it. And death itself is uh, scary for people, and they've been looking for a fountain of youth for years. And, and, and people on TV advertise millions of dollars worth of products to try to make people yep. feel young. And, yeah, I, I don't feel... <laughs> I feel sometimes, you know, with just trauma and stuff from childhood and, and you know, recreating that to deal with it as an adult because I couldn't as a kid. I mean, there have been times where I've been like, okay, this whole being a human being thing, like, I'm over it already. <laughs> this, is, this is painful. I I just, you know, I'm, I'm, I just... I'm done. And then I, um, I've had so many friends that have been suicidal and so on. Um, and, uh, and then I was there when I was holding my father's hand when he passed and he looked, he, he just in before our eyes turned into a, he just looked like a teenager Mm -hmm. just right before our eyes. He just turned into a teenager and it was very peaceful. It was a very peaceful passing. And I don't know what it was. But in that moment that that happened, whatever fear I might have had around death was just gone. And the fear of losing other people was gone as well. I missed him terribly, but I feel like he's still here. I know that he is. I talk to him all the time. Mm -hmm. So I tell myself, whether this is true or delusional, whatever, it works for me. He's not gone. I don't need to miss him. I don't need to be angry with him for leaving. You know, a lot of people get very angry when they're the person that they love leaves because their life, it's really more about them. They're upset about their, that their life has changed. And that's all understandable, of course. But I looked at it like he's not really gone. Just the way that I'm used to experiencing him has changed. Yeah, I, I think, uh, I mean, I, I pray a lot of times, hey, God, Will you give my mom and dad a, a big hug for me today and, you know, tell them Merry Christmas and, and things like that? And the Bible says that we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And uh, and I think, yeah. I think God lets our parents and our loved ones see good things. You know, not there's no tears in heaven, so probably not the bad things that are happening to us. But uh, I think that they can see. And, and, and when we have dreams about our parents, um, lots of times they're real comforting, you know, where the parent is telling you something to encourage you or give you advice or something. And, and I believe in the spiritual dimension, you know, and I know you gals do too. And uh, I believe sometimes God will use our parents to give us a, or he'll give us a dream about them saying, telling us something to guide us. And, and uh, right. I believe sometimes they are present and, uh, and watching us and, you know, when, when it would be a good time for them. Rather than a sad time. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
it's nice not to be someone, and I could change my mind in a few years. I don't know, but I just don't fear. I do not have a fear of death. I feel like we go to a really great place, and I'm going to get to see some dogs that I really miss, and I'm going to get to see my grandma that I played Jim Rummy with. Yeah. There's probably dogs. You know, I'm getting... Other animals. Oh, yeah. Well, I know my always tease, Michael, you're going to go, I'll, I'll, your fa- his family lives forever. I mean, these people can have, you know, seven stents in their heart and <laughs> 12 forms of cancer, and, and they're still walking around at 98 years old, you know, so I've always said, you, you, even though you're 16 years older than I am, you probably outlive me. And he's like, no, I, that can't happen. I won't survive it. I will not survive <laughs> it if that happens. And um, so we can kind of tease each other about that. But I always think, you know, I'll get to see him. He'll be waiting there for me too. So I don't, I don't fear it. And I've even wished for it in some really painful times. So I don't have that strong fear of death that many, many people do. So it's hard for me, I guess, to kind of um, understand that because it's not something that I've ever really been afraid of. What about you, Mel? No, I mean, I'm I'm thinking so many different things. I was just going to say earlier that I know my horse, my diamonds will be in heaven with me. I've had dreams about that and I know she will be. But I remember the first funeral that I remember going to was my grandfather's, my dad's father. And I think I was probably in my early 20s. I had been to my, you know, great grandmother's funeral, but I was really just too young to really understand death. And it was, you know, I may have been 20 or just turned 21. And I went to my grandfather's funeral and it was open casket. And I remember seeing him laying in the casket. And my immediate thought when I saw him was, that's not granddaddy. Like it it just hit me in that moment that it was just a shell and that his spirit was gone. I mean, it literally just hit me on the head like, you know, like a hammer that I was like, that's not even him. Like, And I kind of had this feeling that he was kind of floating above it. It's not like I saw him floating above his own body, but I just kind of had this feeling that I just knew in that moment I had a deep understanding of what death was and things really changed after that. And I don't have a fear of dying at all. Obviously, I want to live to be 102. But I, you know, my, my, gra- not. yeah, it's, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I if probably I feel I really old die tomorrow, and decrepit. I don't if, know. <laughs> yeah. If God appeared and said, Paul, you're going to die tomorrow, you know, I'd, you know, I'd probably be disappointed. Yeah. Or, yeah. Me or too. Something, but, but overall, I'd say, okay, I'm, I'm ready. You know, yeah. I'm ready to go. It's your time. It's your it's your time. But my grandmother, on the other hand, after my grandfather died, Paul, she was one of those women that was definitely happier after my grandfather died. She even got nicer. She got real nice to all of the grandkids and stuff. And <laughs> but I mean, literally, I remember her literally waiting on him hand and foot. And he was always very gracious. Don't get me wrong, but it just I think she just spent her entire life. She was a nurse before she met him. She's, she's looked after people all her life. And when he passed, she, you know, got a place at the Eastern Shore and had a lot of girlfriends and they traveled a lot and giggled and drank wine and rode bikes. And she she really had a lot of fun, too. But when she after he died, um, my my brother passed away and that really hurt her. And then her her first son passed. And after he passed every day. Every single day she would, she would say, I'm ready to go to, I'm ready to go. I want to be with my boys, you know, and, and she, she literally, I mean, I don't think she was really depressed. I wouldn't say there probably were times when she was, but she, she was just ready to go. She would say it all the time. She was just ready to go. And the last time that she went into the hospital, she, she told everybody, I'm not coming out this time. Like she just knew and she stopped eating. And it was just time for her to go. She got her stuff in order before she went into the hospital. And it was, it's interesting that whole end of life is just such an interesting thing to think about. You know, those that have the time to think about it versus those that, you know, are in accidents or die tragically or something like that. And things are just different. But growing old is, I mean, I guess there are times, I mean, I think about my age now and I'm like, not really in a midlife crisis, but. I love getting older because the little things don't bother me anymore. And you, I feel like in my forties, I've really have become more 
secure in who I am. And, you know, if if you're draining, then I just not going to spend time with you. Whereas before, maybe I would have stuck around and thought I needed to try to change your life or something. I don't know. I mean, just things things shift and change. And but I do have friends. Yeah. I have a friend right now that she is in full blown midlife crisis. She she has no I like she just she's thinking about going back to medical school, but she's got six children. And how in the world would she ever do that? And I mean, she literally tells me every time I talk to her, I feel like something is just passing me by and I'm getting old, you know, something's passing me by. And so I have, you know, I I have friends that have that midlife space where they just feel like they've got to do something that everything is too late. And I'm just like, dude, you're only 40, (laughs) you're only 43. Like you've got a good 40 years (laughs) to do some other thing. So just relax and enjoy your kids, you know, but I understand, I, you know, maybe it's just a shift in her soul that's trying to get her to do something different. I don't really know, but yeah. interesting. Ecclesiastes, the last, the 12th chapter says that when you die, the silver cord is loosed mm-hmm. and the spirit is released, you know, from the that body. Like, you know, like, like you were saying about the funeral, it's just, a, that's just the body there. It's a shell. Yep, it was. And, uh, I know I had an accident that changed my perspective. I may have shared this with you guys before, but on November 15th, 1989, because I remember the date, Mm -hmm. a week before that, my uh, uh, mother-in-law, who was a very godly woman, was reading Psalm 9012, teach us the number of our days that we may walk wisely on the earth. And she contemplated it and meditated on it and fell asleep and had a dream that one of her kids was going to die in a car wreck and woke up scared. And so she didn't call any of us at all, but she began and didn't tell any of us. But she began praying every day that none of her kids or their mates would die in a car wreck. And we, and so none of us knew that. And a week later, I was driving my car home from work and I was listening to the Psalms on cassette tape. And it was on Psalm 66 where it says, men are flying over my head, but God will protect me from the fire and from the water. And to this day, I have no idea what that means, what David was thinking when he wrote that. But just as it said that, I had a head-on collision. Oh my you know, goodness! Because I was thinking about that, and I turned, I turned left. And we were both going about 50 miles an hour, and uh, and it was such a hard collision that my car flew up in the air and flipped over, hmm. and landed upside down on the roof. And as I was flipping, I thought, real peacefully, "Oh, this is what God has in store for me today." Hmm. And of course, after I hmm. broke, you know, when I was hanging upside down by the seat belt. And I broke the window with my elbow and climbed out that, you know, that God did deliver me from the fire and from the water, you know, the radiator burst and all that stuff. My car was totaled really bad. And I stupidly crawled back in to get my Dallas Cowboy Weekly and my cassette tape. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> so hoping, you know, hoping it wouldn't explode while I was getting that and crawled back out. After I got back out, I did get scared, you know. That, then I realized it sort of dawned on me what had happened. And and then uh, the ambulance got there first. And I told the ambulance, you know, I'm not hurt and the lady that was driving the other car wasn't hurt and both cars were just smashed to smithereens but neither of us had a scratch and so the ambulance was pulling off and the cops pulled up and you know i was standing in my suit next to my car he didn't know i was the driver and he says did the ambulance take away the body and i said no i am the body (laughs) you know oh wow (laughs) he couldn't believe it he couldn't believe that i lived i said no nobody nobody got hurt Mm. that night when i went to bed i had a dream and Jesus was in the dream, and he said, Paul, uh, wake up and go get that cassette tape and put it in your Walkman, you know, your radio, and listen to it until there's a verse that hits you between the eyes. Mm. So I got up and started with Psalm 66, 67, 68, 69, 70, and I said, God, please hurry. I, You know, I want to get back to sleep, you know. And when it got to – and, and I, I still didn't know anything about my mother-in-law. When it got to Psalm 90, 12, it hit me between the eyes. Teach us to number our days that we may walk wisely on the earth. And it dawned on me, and I and I told the Lord, I said, okay, I'm going to assume from now on that I died. On November 15th, 1989, I was in a car accident, and I died. And so every day mm-hmm. from this day forward is a gift. It's an unmerited gift that I don't deserve. That, And so every day is a gift from God that I, that I want to use to the utmost to, to enjoy and to help others enjoy and, to, you know, help people and do th- do good things. So I dreamt that. I mean, I, I mean, I had that experience and then went back to sleep. And the next day, my mother-in-law called me and she said, I heard you had an accident. And I said, yeah, you know, my car turned upside down and all that. And she said, well, Paul, I've been praying for you. And I didn't tell her about the dream or anything. She said, I've been praying for you every day for the past week 
that you wouldn't die in a car accident. I said, now why in the world oh my would gosh. you mm. pray a prayer like that? You know, and she told me about her experience reading Psalm 9012 and having a dream and that one of her, her kids got in a car accident. And so explained her, that's the verse that I woke up and God hit me in between the eyes with. So that was a real reinforcer to me that it was a meaningful experience. I had a dream one time that my daughter who was in graduate school at Rosemead at the time in psychology and that she was going to have an accident. I saw her have an accident in the dream. She was driving down a California highway and all of a sudden her car came to a stop and somebody ran into her rear end. So I was going to call her about it. And my wife said, no, she'll just think you're nuts, you know? So I didn't call her, but that afternoon she was driving down a California highway and her brakes locked suddenly and somebody ran into her rear end. Mm. But fortunately she wasn't hurt, but when she called me, she said, I told her, I said, no, you're not going to believe this. So ask your mom whether I'm telling you the truth or not. But I had a dream that that would happen last night. So your mom and I, were praying for you. But when you yeah. have experiences like that, it makes you think, you know, when that death's okay when it comes. But in the meantime, let's make the use of each day. Each day, yeah, let's live each day one day at a time. Yeah, those things do really make you appreciate your time here, and they do help on those days when you are really in a lot of pain. Uh, Melanie, what do you think about that? Because I know you have those kinds of prophetic dreams too. I do. I've um I've had some pretty intense dreams, and and it's so funny <laughs> that we're talking about this right now because I'm just I've been thinking about some things in my life lately, and I had a dream, Paul, one time that my youngest son was in a car wreck and he actually passed, and I've never had a dream where one of my children has actually passed, and it haunted me for months. This dream I had that he had died in this car wreck. And in my dream, I just, I fell to my knees and I screamed so loud. I, 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 it was just the worst dream and it really affected some big decisions I was making in my life at the time. I mean, I have had dreams um, after my brother passed away, Chris, and I think I had some real you know, interesting dreams where I just feel like they were kind of visits and the light was real different in the dreams and everything was real bright and crisp and they felt kind of like visit dreams. They didn't feel like just dreams mm-hmm. that I was dreaming. That has happened. Yes. Only that has happened to scores I know. and scores and scores of my patients. Yes. And they lost a loved one and they'd have yeah. dreams where the loved one was coming to visit them and things like that. Yeah, yeah, they were really, it was just really comforting. I mean, it's not like I got a message or anything, but it was just really comforting that that he was happy and he was in a good place and he was always such a jokester and just loved to have fun. And one of the dreams I had, he was literally in God's house is, is how I see it. And the stairs were marble and he was sliding down the stairs of this huge marble mansion, this beautiful, shiny, and was just laughing and so happy as if just to say, I'm, I'm so good. I'm fine. Did you ever figure out what the dream meant about your son? I didn't. I was thinking at the time, I was thinking about making a pretty big move. And I felt really, really uneasy about it. I think I shared that with you in another interview, Paul. I I was thinking about moving to a different area that I've never wanted to live in. And I was thinking about moving back for specific reasons. And and I was really just kind of a nervous wreck about it and had just felt uneasy and uneasy and uneasy about it. And then I had this dream and I recognized the hospital because my oldest, my 16-year-old son had surgery at the Children's Hospital in Tidewater in Norfolk when he was a child and the hospital that they took my youngest son to in the dream was the children's hospital in Norfolk, which is where I was thinking about moving because I recognized the the stainless doors that they took him through. And, you know, I, I saw them take my son into the doors limp and then I kept asking about him. And then one of the nurses finally told me that he that he didn't make it. And as soon as I had that dream, I woke up the next morning and I was just like, I don't need to move. <laughs> maybe know? God used it. Maybe, maybe God he used did. it to help yes. you decide not to move. Yeah, I mean, it was a it was a really I was really disturbed about that for a long time. It also really it encouraged me to face some some really deep seated fears that I had. And it was just kind of like the fire, the, a catalyst that, that started me on, I feel like, kind of a little mental health journey to really conquer some anxiety that was just really deeply rooted. So it was definitely, I think God used it in a lot of ways. But yeah, it immediately stopped me in my tracks from even considering making the move. Um, you know, one, yeah. one sad thing that we ought to talk about right out of time, 
that happens is that a lot of our loved ones become senile. Yes. And, yes. Uh, and, and that's one thing. There's some things about aging that, that are negative and not any fun. And, you know, of course, getting, we, we get more diseases and I think the average person 65 or older takes seven medications and, and you know, and, when you're 30 or 35, you don't take any usually. And, but I've had loved ones. My, my own brother had Parkinsonism. And when you get Parkinsonism 50% of the time, you eventually will become psychotic and delusional. And he was such a sweet guy, a loving guy, a, a former pastor and counselor. And, but he got delusional and, you know, want to get fights with people because he thought they were trying to harm his family. And, and it was sad watching him go downhill. And I know. Kristen, you've talked about, you know, people that you love that. that uh, yeah, it's, it's, I, I get a little, I don't know why I'm, I don't know why I'm not afraid of this. I guess maybe because it's, I mean, there's nothing I can do about it, but um, I don't know about my father's, my biological father's side, but I know that uh, four members of my mother's side all, have, you know, were senile and some had very violent tempers and very, seemed like they regressed back to childhood ages where they were very angry and mean yeah. um, a lot of the time. But then on the other side of it would be extremely loving. But it was very, you know, difficult for all of us to yeah. hear about this. And then, you know, for those of us that were around, that are around that person to experience that behavior. And when someone's in that state, they're not going to listen to you tell them there's a problem. No, when you're delusional. You need to, we need to go to yeah. a doctor. Yeah, you're delusional. You need to. You're delusional. You're Nobody forgetting else is things. Right. Exactly. Yes. And somehow cutting off relationships with people and doing all kinds of just things that are so unlike them and uh, just absolutely belligerent and downright, well, I call it pit viper mean if you try to speak any kind of rationale to them. And that's hard because then your last you know, memories of that person are of them being extremely abusive. And, of course, yeah. it's because of what's and happening yeah, to them, so they fault. can't really they're, help it. Yes, yeah, their brain chemicals uh, being messed up, their dopamine in particular. And uh, sometimes if they get on a on an antipsychotic medication, it'll, it'll help ease that. Uh, most people, as we get older, get nicer and, and more, more loving and gentle and mm -hmm. sure and things. But uh, people that get... Uh, Alzheimer's or other kinds of senility. N not all of them get mean or anything, but a lot of times the chemicals really get messed up in your brain and that make you uh, paranoid and delusional and, you know, think people are all out to get you and want to fight them back right. and things. And they can get feisty. Yeah. Yep, yep, exactly. I have a funny story oh, about a senile a... moment. Let me tell a funny story, Christy, and then Kristen, and then you'll Christy. Absolutely. What am I thinking, Christy? I'm getting senile <laughs> over here. Jeez. No, my grandmother, the same grandmother that recently passed and knew she was passing, my grandfather or my, my dad went to pick her up at her house. She was living by herself, and we were picking her up for Thanksgiving dinner. And so my dad gets to the house, and she has on her Christmas sweater. But she, you know, he doesn't say anything. He just thinks, well, maybe she's just being seasonal, you know. So he goes and picks her up for Thanksgiving dinner and she's got on this Christmas sweater and she walks in the house with us all to eat and she says, Merry Christmas. <laughs> and it wasn't Christmas. It was Thanksgiving. And she, she meant was, it, right? She did. Oh, she totally <laughs> thought it was, she totally thought she was coming for Christmas dinner and none of us said no. anything, but there were so many little moments like that or she would turn the heat up to like 90 in the house and eventually my dad had to get a lock for the heater so she couldn't get to it. And <laughs> they took her car away and she would take the keys to the lawnmower and drive the lawnmower around the neighborhood and the neighbors would call my dad and be like, Earl, your mama's on the lawnmower again, you know, so people yeah. do crazy things when they're senile. <laughs> but anyway, they, just, they wander off. Yeah, they do. They I want to be I want to be the sweetest um, person in the nursing home. You know what I mean? Like I, I, I feel like I'm getting um, nicer and nicer and nicer. Not I'm not a doormat by any means. And I think I had to go through a, a stage where I really where a handful of people would say that I'm not nice. And the reality is they weren't nice and I didn't take it. <laughs> um, but that seems to have 
sort of, I guess that was a, a few year pass of having some people like that in my life. And I stood up for myself and now I don't, it doesn't seem like I need to learn that lesson as much, if at all, anymore. But um, I just feel like I'm getting a lot wiser, a lot more patient. I don't go to DEF CON 1 over things. I kind of see ahead um, in my own, you know, getting older. I, I'm excited about it. Like, I'm excited that I'm going to be 48. I'm so excited about this. I think it's fantastic. I'm so excited. I'm so excited that I'm getting closer to 50. So to me, it's exciting. And what I hope is that as I continue to get older, that I just am, you know, one of those people, if I end up in a nursing home or wherever I may end up, there that everybody there loves coming to my room because <laughs> I'm one of the nice patients. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I hope I never get senile. I, I, I do fear that. But I mean, fortunately, I mean, my mom never did. She died at 97 and she was still pretty, you know, she was more forgetful than she was when she was younger, but, but she was still pretty in pretty good mental shape. I do fear that. I I, I don't want to, I'd rather that God took me home than that he let me uh, linger around five years, not knowing who I was or who, who you were or other people are. Yeah. Um, I'd rather go to heaven and go through that. Yeah, I don't think anyone wants uh wants to have to lay lay around and suffer. My mom talks about that because she's been diagnosed with lupus in the last two years and it affects her connective tissue, so she's got some heart problems and that'll probably be what ends up getting her is congestive heart failure and there's bad circulation and she's just always been really healthy, so this has been really traumatic for her. But, you know, she talks about please just let me go. <laughs> you know, if she has to lay around and circulation gets bad and they have to amputate and that can and affect any part of the body including it can the brain. it, it can, can any part of the body it really can so it's but you know paul i i remember reading um i it was uh i think someone gave me the book actually after my brother died and it was written by an american indian and it was basically his story of or someone had written him story of being on his deathbed and literally it took him a very long time to pass and he suffered a lot. But really up until the very last moment, God was working in his life and he felt like that he needed to last that long and suffer that long to realize what he needed to before he passed. So I don't see reason in suffering for some of the horrible things people have to suffer through, but he certainly, that book certainly made sense of it. In fact, I think he was supposed to die a year before he actually died, and he was trying to live until he and his wife's like 50th wedding anniversary or something, and he actually did it. Yeah. He actually literally lived and died on the day of their wedding anniversary. So it's a real interesting story. So I guess you just yeah, never you know, know. People that uh, that find out they have, uh, this is a true research study from cancer victims that people that uh, that have different kinds of cancer and their doctors based on statistics say, you know, you have 18 months to live or 24 months to live or things like that. People that just stuff their feelings and don't talk about it die younger than that. And people that open up and, and share their experiences uh, in prepare for death and talk about death and talk about dying and, and talk about how they feel about it and things like that actually live a lot longer than the expected amount. So it helps you live longer to, even when you're dying of cancer or things like that, to be able to, you know, share your gut level feelings with people that care. Which is why I'm so happy that all of us are in the mental health field. (laughs) (laughs) So true. No one is going to accuse me of not saying, Every possible thing that I could say um, in terms of my feelings, good, bad, or indifferent. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I don't think I'll, I don't feel like I will be in that place thinking, oh, there was that stone that I left unturned in relation to what yeah. I told someone or what I shared or, or what I listened to yeah. from other people, just taking that time to listen. That was one of the things that I... When I was a kid, I was always with my grandma, who I absolutely adored, and I always hung out with older people. And, you know, I was, this is when I was very young, from like five years old all the way up until, you know, teenager. And I always have, you know, done some kind of volunteer work with people that are elderly. And I just love listening to the stories about their 
lives and all that wisdom. And I never got that, oh, I feel sorry for this person thing. I thought they I just they're always fascinating to me as a human being. This person has lived this whole life with all these experiences. And some of them, you know, were pretty racy or, you know, or something that you look at the way that they are now and you and they tell you something that, you know, they did in their 20s. And I think you. <laughs> yeah, I get that experience lots of times. <laughs> but it's a, yeah, aging, I don't know. It, it hits everybody differently, but, uh, and it hits our mental health differently. So I guess maybe the, I have to say it right now, Alzheimer's part, uh, that part, could make me nervous. The senility part could make me nervous. I don't want to get mean with it. If that happens, I hope that I horrible, wouldn't it? Um, yeah, that I would not like. I hope that I'm super sweet and that I don't, because if I don't know, because I don't remember something, then there's nothing for me to be upset about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's what you hope for. Alzheimer's, if people get it when they're young, then it can be genetic. If people get it when they're old, then it's usually not. Uh, we don't know what causes it and what doesn't cause it yet in most cases. And, and I know people that um, that read a lot or play video games or do things to keep their minds active and have a lot later onset of senility huh. than, uh, than people that are have idle minds. So exercising your brain can help it to last longer. There's medications now, uh, yes. Aricept, Namenda, other new ones, that if somebody's starting to get Alzheimer's, they can get on those medications or a combination of them, and a third of them will get a lot better, and a third won't get better, but it'll delay yes. the, the onset of the senility by maybe five or ten years, and a third of them, it doesn't affect much. Huh. But, but a lot of people are benefited by modern medications that, that actually uh, can delay Alzheimer's by a decade. That's awesome. One, I mean, one that's last. In years. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, exactly. One last question I wanted to ask. If what I've heard is if there are things that, you know, root behaviors of someone, and I, I said root, not rude, but so root behaviors of someone, let's say if someone is, you know, OCD or have been extremely moody or they tend to be negative, I've heard that as they age, uh, and if you're, we're dealing with senility or Alzheimer's, that those behaviors that are so core to who they are and how they've always behaved, those are exacerbated during this time. Is that a true statement that you guys have heard as well? Lots of times, I don't think in every case it is, but yeah, lots of times people become more like like you said, if they have OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, maybe they could hide it enough to function, and a lot of people wouldn't even know they had it. But when they get older, you know, they, you know, they'll, they'll put chairs around them and do all sorts of bizarre things, and, and get yeah more, more OCD to an extreme. I've seen that happen. So I've watched a lot. Uh, yeah, I've watched uh, someone who's OCD their entire life, and yes, they can mask it very, very, very well. Not anymore, though. And you can be in your kitchen, you know, well, I had a friend of mine standing there drinking from a coffee cup, and they're so OCD now in their elderly years that they are literally on their hands and knees wiping the floor in between where that person walked to the point of almost tripping them and then wiping the bottom of the cup that they're drinking out of at that moment so that then the liquid spills on the person and then wiping the counter where the cup was just sitting. Like we're talking yeah. so and following housekeepers around and handy men, people, and just like literally two inches from that person just <laughs> and getting caught up and, you know, getting hurt because they're yeah. in the way and in, they in won't. Again. And again, in most cases, psychiatrists, there's some psychiatrists that specialize in seeing the elderly. And, uh, I would advise if you, if that's a relative of yours that, of somebody that's that way, that they see that psychiatrist. But in most cases, different medications can make that significantly better. Even if they're senile and don't know where they are and who they are. Or the psychosis, uh, if somebody becomes psychotic because of Alzheimer's or Parkinsonism, uh, there's medications they can take that often will make it a lot less severe or, or even go away. So getting know, them to take it is the yeah, problem. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's right. Because they can become extremely combative combative and defensive and angry. Yeah, how dare you say that I need that, even though they've taken medication other times in their lives. And really, at some point, you have to just kind of, okay, I'm not, I can't make, I can't force this person to, you know, to do this. Um, You know, some members of my family have said, well, if we ever turn out like so-and-so, like Aunt Lou or whatever, please pitch us off the balcony. And because Aunt Lou was the bad example of how you don't want to be when you're um, a senior citizen in our family. And I'm making up that name, but, you know, that she was, this person was like the example of every, all the kids in the family would say that if we ever turn out like Aunt Lou, you know, please take the wheelchair and find a cliff. Just get rid of us. And sadly, some in the family have become Aunt Lou and they don't and yeah. they won't hear of it. Yeah. And there's you, nothing that you can do. Something else that I want to say before we run out of time as a psychiatrist is and I forgot now. <laughs> Boy, I have to edit that out. Oh shoot! It was really, no, this is it was really important this too. Paul's Alzheimer's. All I forgot. I'm getting. It. I'm getting. You know. Yeah. Oh, no way. You are. What was it? Oh, and I know what it was. Okay. Awesome. Uh, something else I want to say before we run out of time is that a lot of people feel false guilt, like if their parents get senile, that that, that they have to have them live in their home. And I don't think if if you want to do that, you know, then it's a free country. You can do that. But I don't recommend that. And uh, uh, if they get, you know, where they're going to wander off into the woods and things and you have to be with them 24 hours a day, I don't think that's a good thing for your family. That's not good for your marriage. It's not good no. for your kids. And I, I think putting them in a retirement home is a kinder thing to do for them. They're Absolutely. And there's people their age that they can uh, hang out with and all that. I know when my mom got old enough, I mean, she lived in an apartment until she was about 94 or 95 or something like that. But then when she got old enough where she would fall down sometimes and couldn't get back up, and she'd have to call me at 3 in the morning, and I'd have to drive to her apartment to get her get her up, you know, and things like that. When that started happening, we said we moved her to a uh, an assisted living facility, and she dreaded it. She said, I don't want to go there. I don't want to go there. And we said, well, it's time. You've got to. And once she was there about two weeks, she said, I wish I would have come here a couple of years ago. <laughs> said, this is right. fun. I'm having meals with people and, and playing games with them and having fellowship and watching TV with people. This is wonderful. Yep. And she had her, if yep. she wanted to be by herself, she went in her room and was by herself. So I would hate to be a burden on my kids. I'd, I'd rather be in a assisted living facility. I think I would enjoy it. I, I could go live there now and enjoy it, you know. <laughs> I would too, so I just, but so I've I visited get back so out many. And go to work every day, you know. But, um, <laughs> exactly. So don't yeah, feel like your parents have to live with you when they get older. You know, if you right. decide to do that, right. that's your business, and I'm not condemning you, but but don't feel like you have to. Mm, that's a good point. Yeah, my so, um, Melanie, Melanie, you you yeah. close the show tonight, Mel. <laughs> um, I mean, I was just gonna say that. My grandmother was, she did not want to go to a nursing home and she made it very, she was still spry enough to be so mean to any nurse that my dad sent over there to try to look after her that he just ended up doing it because she would make everyone cry and they would leave. <laughs> um, I don't know that it was her being mean and senile as it was. She was just determined she was going to stay in her home until, until she went into the hospital and died and she did. But you know, this is death is just a big of a part of life is living. It's we're born and then and then we pass. And it's I think I remember reading that it might be another American Indian statement. It, it really is just a big of a part. And animals do dying a lot better than we do. I feel like, you know, they're ready for it. They're prepared. They know their lifespan. So uh, growing older and, and passing can be a tough thing for a lot of us, I think. But um, it can also be Wonderful, wonderful things about growing older. I think you're more comfortable with yourself. You are wiser. It's easier to make decisions. Mm -hmm. Um, You do. I think most of the time you end up having a little bit more time on your hands, which is wonderful. You can pick up, you know, hobbies and such that that might really make you happy or you've never tried before if you just never had the time. So, yeah, I think it's really just about perspective. And hopefully all of us will, will go into 
to old age healthy. But if that's not the case, then obviously there, there are more challenges. So grow old gracefully, yep. I guess. <laughs> I, I, like, I like being 72 and I'm getting, I feel like the older I get, the more respect I get too from, from yeah. people and other, uh, you know, leaders in my field will call and ask for advice just based on my years of experience and things like that. And then, uh, I told you gals in the past couple of months, even the White House has called yep. me and had me come there and, and met, met with me for, so I could give them advice on mental health and been in on some conference calls and things. And, and so that feels pretty good. You know, that feels pretty good to get be older and have that be a meaningful, positive experience. Well, Paul, you have worked, worked for every bit of that respect. You've done a lot and contributed a lot and still continue. So you have earned that respect you're getting. Not so sure it's just age. You've worked hard for it. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe, maybe it's just more humility now. (laughs) Yeah, maybe it is. Well, there's only one way to go on that. I, I know the older I get, the more humble I get because there's such a long way to go that, you know, <laughs> it can't go any other way. You know? <laughs> can't get more prideful. I know. Man, I think about that too. Man, am I so much of an easier person uh, than I was even. Sometimes I think even just, you know, this past year, or last year, towards the beginning of the year when I started this podcast network, there was so much drama, drama, drama going on with different people. And um, I was under so much stress. And I think now, of course, I needed to go through that. It certainly made me wiser. And and I'm going into a new year with a new birthday and new age. But I still look at those times and think, what the heck was I so stressed out about? So some of that stuff was just utter nonsense. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, the things we used to worry about, huh? <laughs> mm-hmm. That now wouldn't even that I'd be like, whatever, move on, move on. Yep. So, well, I think this was good. We uh, we touched on different ideas and and truisms for each of us around what it means to get older, no matter what age you are. So, thank you both for joining me, and thanks to the listeners for tuning in again to Mental Health News Radio. Get ready for it because here it comes. But first, thank you again to our sponsors like EverythingEHR.com, devoted to helping organizations finding the best electronic health record in behavioral health. And Service Dogs by Warren Retrievers, SDWR.org, a nonprofit organization that provides service dogs to those with unique abilities and invisible diseases to include autism, diabetes, epilepsy, and PTSD. Until there's a cure, there's a dog. And hey, an SDWR service dog is at work every day with one of our own team members. If you have a question, visit us at mentalhealthnewsradio.com or our network of podcasters at mhnrnetwork.com. Disruptors, healers, technologists, advocates, and most importantly, voices to be heard from all corners of the globe. Thank you so much for joining us. And now a final word from our therapy dog, Miles. Good boy.